Hey there, welcome to the VC2 Multicast. The month of February, we'll be looking at one of VC2's DNA markers, discipleship. We'll be diving into what it means to be a disciple, how we disciple others as disciples of Christ, and what that looks like in our everyday lives. Now, let's get to this week's message. I'm concluding today a series on discipleship, and today we're going to look at my belief that discipleship is best done one-on-one. Now, the first week we looked at what discipleship is and, and gave some definitions, and I'll cover those just briefly in a minute. The second week we looked at discipleship group in the context of group meetings. We talked about our grow group structure and how we believe it's important that you have a group to be a part of. But today I want to talk about the, the discipleship aspect of one-on-one relationships. Now, for some of you, it's very natural to have friendships. Some of you like friendships. Others, we don't like friendships. Some of us are John Waynes. Others, you are more like Lucy. You just want to be friends with everybody, right? And so some of us, it comes natural to have relationships. But I want to be quick to point out that just because you have a lot of relationships doesn't mean you have a lot of meaningful relationships. And so I want to talk about discipleship in the context of meaningful relationships. Looking at Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. I love the book of Colossians. Oh, who am I kidding? I love every book in there. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kind of, I got to stop. Let me stop. Let me start over. I got so excited about what I'm going to teach today. I didn't even say hello to the Naples campus and the Macon campus and to all the people joining us around the world and all of you uh, peeping in to spy out our freedom. All of you. I didn't even say hello to you. Hello. <laughs> so... Uh, now I'm going to get back started. <laughs> and, and I got so excited, I didn't even tell you who I am. Because this may be your first time here, and you're like, who's that man that just stood up? My, see, I just got excited. Do y'all, any of y'all have a puppy that you're training? <laughs> Does anybody have a puppy they're training? You, do I need to say more? I just got too excited. My name is Chad Waller. I pastor this wonderful church along with my wife, Melinda Waller. And we are so honored to be a part of what God's doing in central Georgia. And if this is your first time here, we are so glad you're here. And we love you big time. Glad you are with us. Hope you have fun. Now let's look at the book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. Good luck editing all that, Mr. Soundman. Everything in me wants to sing, Mr. Soundman. You guys, I've got guests here today, and I wanted y'all to be nice. (laughs) Okay, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Who are God's chosen ones? And he calls you holy and beloved. Isn't that beautiful? Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Oh boy, that gets deep real quick, doesn't it? That's what he says we're supposed to be like. If anyone has a complaint against another. Now that would never happen in church, now would it? Okay, so going on. Forgiving each other. How are we to forgive? Glad you said, as the Lord has forgiven you. And how did he forgive? Completely. So you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Richly, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, I've truly come to believe that discipleship is done best in the context of life on life, not in a sermon, not in a classroom, and not even in a small group setting. Now, When I first started out preaching almost 30 years ago, I really believed I was going to change a lot of people. Boy, I just knew I was going to do it. And it didn't take long, probably longer than it should have for me to realize preaching doesn't change a lot of people. It just doesn't. I don't know if y'all know this, but y'all don't listen a lot. 
If I could find out the things you, well, no, I wouldn't even do that. Who am I kidding? I mean, I know you're trying to listen, but right now somebody is thinking about lunch in here. I have learned in my years to know somebody in here thinking, when are you going to finish this thing up? Because I'm kind of getting hungry already. And somebody wanting to get to the buffet before somebody else. I know some of you are already kind of thinking, and, and, and some of you are looking, why would you make me come here? So, somebody might be thinking, well, I like to worship, but he starts talking loud. Jesus, he talked forever. Right? Go on. So I, it took me a while to realize that it's not a sermon. A ser Listen, if sermons could save the world, it looked like we'd be saved. Yeah. Come on, somebody, because there's been plenty of them. And so I had to realize there's something deeper. They're necessary, but it's not the only thing. Do not get me wrong. I'm not saying teaching is not necessary. It's necessary. It's the job of a teacher to teach. It's the job of a preacher to preach. We have a calling, but, but there's got to be more. And then, so we, we, we got real smart and we started doing small groups. But inside the small group, uh, even some folks will never speak up. Some of you will go to a small group setting and you're never going to say a whole lot. We have ways that we try to get people to talk in small groups. And some of you will figure those ways out and you'll finagle all around. You, some of you will never spill your secrets in a small group. And let me just go and be honest with you. I will never spill my guts among folks I don't trust. And so if you think you're just going to get a small group together and say, okay, now you tell us everything you've ever struggled with. The devil is a lie. I, one of y'all is a Judas in this circle. I don't know which one of you is, but... It, it, <laughs> statistics show one of y'all going to tell something. Come on. Three out of four people crazy. I ain't one of them, so let's just go ahead and count this circle. One of y'all is. Hello? And, and, and you, you tell oh, let's get in this group and let's just tell everything. mm mm I might tell a few things. I ain't telling you everything. I'm telling nobody everything. You must be kidding. Well, brother, the Bible says confess. You. Oh, you better go study that thing out. You better dig that thing out. You better dig that thing out. Because it ain't told me to tell somebody I don't even trust or I don't even know to confess something that they will use against me because they have evil intent. You hear me? Y'all picking up what I'm laying down? And so there's got to be something more. Because I do believe where darkness remains, evil breeds. So I do believe there has to be someone in your life you can trust. I do believe that there needs to be meaningful relationships where they'll speak the truth to you. you know, I was watching this program and they were talking about people lying. And they were saying we all lie. And immediately some of you said, well, I don't lie. If I walked up to you today and said... Uh, you know, does this shirt make me look skinny? Most of you in the room would say, oh, Pastor, I can tell you lost weight. Yeah, that makes you look real skinny. Some of you would skirt around it, but what we call a white line, most of y'all would wash that thing. You would whitewash your comments because there are only a few of you going to say, Pastor, you look as fat as you did last week. <laughs> right? Remember, I went to the nursing home to uh, meet, uh, visit with my Aunt Bessie. We'd been away for, uh, we were pastoring in Michigan. We came home to visit. And I went over to see my Aunt Bessie in a wheelchair, just sitting there at nursing home. And she was sitting there. I had not seen her for years. And she was losing her mind. I walked up and said, Aunt Bessie, you remember me? And she looked up. She said, no, I don't, but you've gotten fat as a hog. <laughs> and I thought... Well, Aunt Bessie, now that's not something nice to say to anybody. She said, it might not be nice, but it's true. And I said, oh, I would to God that more Christians were like that. Because sometimes the true thing that we speak in love, in love, is not always the nice thing. We need meaningful relationships. So what is a disciple? Let's start with that. Someone who follows Jesus is learning to live like Jesus, love like Jesus, and leave behind what Jesus left behind. Someone who is learning to live like Jesus. You're following Jesus and you've made it your life's goal to live like Jesus lived, to love like Jesus loved, and to leave behind what Jesus left behind. The other two are self-explanatory, but leave behind what Jesus left behind. What does that mean? 
When Jesus came up on a funeral and he raised them up from the dead, what did he leave behind? Chaos, but beautiful chaos. When he came up on a sick person and he said, be healed, what did he leave behind? A healed person. When you look at what Jesus... Now listen, you run into some Christians and they leave behind some stuff, right? Like when, come on, y'all, don't play it. Don't act like it's Sunday morning, y'all get religious on me. You know what it's like when you run into somebody by the celery that you wish you hadn't have seen. And as soon as you see them, you're like, oh, sweet God. And you try to stand and play that invisible game. If I close my eyes, they won't see me, they won't see me. Hey, sister, did you see I have another scar from yet another surgery? And all of a sudden, they start talking about how awful their life is. And, and when they're done, they've left something behind, and it's kind of, ew. You ever run into people and when you're done with them, you're like, ew, ew. <laughs> Maybe you're the kind of person that when people are done. <laughs> that wouldn't be nice to do at church, so I'm going to go on. So discipleship then would be helping each other grow up in these areas. In learning to love like Jesus, live like Jesus, and leave behind what Jesus left behind. I tell you, I want to leave behind something when I leave people. When I walk away from people, I want to say, who was that mask man? Amen. I, I, when I walk away, I want him to say, didn't my heart burn within me as he talked about Jesus? I want people to say, I'm kind of jealous that he loves Jesus as much as he does. I want people to see the love of God in my life. I want them to feel love and acceptance. I want them to know that Jesus really does love them. And he really does want to save them. I don't want them walking away feeling beat up. Amen. I don't want them walking away feeling like, good Lord, whatever God he serves, I don't want none of that. That means we are in each other's lives. We're helping each other grow and helping each other learn to walk, talk, and live like Jesus. When you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, that's what we were encouraging the scripture to do. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We need the word of Christ in us to help each other in life situations. We need to know what the Word of God says about situations. I believe it's important when we're going through events, when we're experiencing things, that we know the Word. It says in that scripture that we teach and admonish one another. Now, the church has relegated this job to pastors or to people in ministry. You're the ones to teach and admonish. But Paul wrote this not to a group of pastors, but to the church. He said to the church, I want you to let all this dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And we look at it and think he's talking about the whole Bible. Do you understand the Bible wasn't even like it is now when he said that? So he's talking about the words that Jesus had spoken and that they had passed down and they had taught. He's talking about the things that Jesus taught He's talking about the old covenant and the, the, the new things and all the things that they're now learning about. We have the privilege of having the whole Bible. Let this word and the words that God speaks to your heart and illuminate, let them dwell in you richly and do that so that you can teach and admonish. Now, teach, we understand. You teach somebody something that they might not be aware of, but admonish that word in the Greek. It's a, a funny word, neuthetic or neuthesis. It's, it, it literally means to, to um, correct, to train, or, or to counsel. To counsel. And you see, we, we have put counsel down to be just something that pastors do. Somebody would come into my office and say, Pastor, counsel me. Tell me what I need to do about this situation but beloved listen that's what we should be doing for one another right. we should be saying when you say to your friend i've got a problem and i don't know what to do about it the first thing we could should think is what does the bible say about that Amen. let me tell you this precious friend partner best friend uh, that i have pastor melinda my my the love of my life that woman will lay it on me in a heartbeat when i'm saying something unscriptural she would just say, now, what does the Bible say about that? And sometimes, y'all, don't be hating, but sometimes I want to say, I don't care what the Bible says right now. I just want to be mad. And she'll say, and what does the Bible say about that? <laughs> what, does this, what does the Bible say about a man beating up his wife? Now quit saying that stuff to me. <laughs> Come on. 
I, I love the fact that she's faithful to say to me, okay, I hear and I see what you're doing. I see what you're going through. But what does the Bible say? What scripture are we going to apply here? And I, I make it, I'm, I'm trying to be funny, but I want to tell you something. She does it in such a way to be honoring to me, to be sweet to me. Sometimes she does it because she knows that I know what the Bible says. And sometimes she'll play that. Like, like just, well, is there a scripture that talks about that? What did, did you, how about that sermon that you taught? Did you, you teach about that? Yes, I taught about that, Melinda. I know. See, you need friends that will admonish you, counsel you, that will not just go along with your pity parties, that will not just get in the dumps with you. Because the last thing you need is somebody in the dumps with you. You need somebody lifting you out of the dumps. And you need somebody to speak truth to you. Now, points I've learned about discipleship, three points. Discipleship is best done life on life. Because you see, as you walk with me in life, we get to see each other, the reality. We get to see. When you walk with me, you get to see the me I really am, not the me I want you to see. Because right. yeah. yeah. just face the facts. I'm not, <laughs> I hate to use my family, but they're the only examples I have. If I'd grown up in your family, I'd use your family. <laughs> my grandmother was the most amazing phone answerer I've ever seen in my entire life. Amazing. She could be letting you have it, telling you where the dog died. <laughs> Only my northern friends even know what that means. She'd just be letting you hold one. Just, you know, I told you if I have to tell you kids. And the phone ring, and grandma would say, hello. <laughs> and I'm like, how does she go from getting on to me to hello and sounds so sweet? And everybody, your grandma is so sweet. Oh, you don't know her. <laughs> She got that black, black belt hanging up. She don't wear it. She wear it out. <laughs> oh, your grandma's the sweetest. Oh, I used to love to hear your grandma sing. They would say, and I'm thinking, I love to hear her sing, but the other part, ooh. You see, because we don't always let people see all of us, do we? Because we bring our presentables. Like, Hello, bless God, brother. How are you? I'm fine, brother. And you? But you didn't wake up and say that to your wife this morning. We going to church? I don't know. I don't feel like it. All right. You want to go? I don't know. Don't talk to me. I have my coffee yet. Right. I don't think a single soul here woke up and said, well, except my wife, woke up and said, bless God, it's morning, another day. Let's do this thing. You see, so the reality is and that some parts of our life are stinky, aren't they? Yes, they are. And sometimes we go through hard situations. And it's in the doing life together, in the difficulties of life, as well as the mundane parts of life, where we see what we really believe. You can shout hallelujah all you want up in here. But when you're out there where the trouble hits and where the bills have to be paid and where people be lying on you and things be said about you, then let's see how much you got a hallelujah. Uh, so we can all teach, yes, bless those who persecute you and shoot them if you can. No, that ain't what it said. That ain't what it said. But see, you see, you can't pick and choose if I'm going to follow Christ then I've got to follow Christ and be like Christ. And that means sometimes we we'll have to say, no, you cannot hit him in the mouth. Okay, Lord. It's best done life on life. It's in the issues of life that we learn to apply the truths. It's where we find out if we're really living the word or not. I want to tell you something. You know what the world is sick of? It's people who say they're believers and don't believe. We're sick of it. When, when, when somebody working with you can look and say, I'm just as righteous and holy acting as you are, and you say you go to church, you're a, a deacon or this or that in the church, you teach Sunday school, you do this, that, that, and, and, and you, you look at you. Why would I want? That's the reality of it. And that's why we must rise up and say, I'm going to follow Christ and hold each other accountable. Bro, you said you had gave You remember that testimony you gave where you said you had gave up that stuff? Why are you holding it? Yeah. Well, brother, I wouldn't want to offend someone. Oh, but you'd be a willing party to their death? Yeah. See, you see, we are called to encourage one another. 
We are called to, you say, well, that would be getting in someone's stuff. If you're a real friend, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Some of the best conversations I've ever had are some of the hardest conversations to ever had. And the fruit of those faithful friendships is sweet. Next, discipleship cannot be successful if it's fate or forced on us. I believe it's best when it's organic and it naturally flows out of relationship. I believe that many of us would like to be in deep, meaningful discipleship relationships but I don't think that you can force it on anyone. The truth is, I, don't, I believe if you don't want to be in a relationship, there's not a thing I can do about it. If you don't want to be in a deep, meaningful discipleship relationship, if somebody says to you, you know, man, can I tell you what the Bible says? And your usual response is, no, nah, I don't care. Then you're not even wanting to follow Christ. You're just playing games. And if you go here because you like the music, then you go to a church where you like the music. That's all it is. Let's just be honest. That's all it's about. It can't be fake or forced. That's why here we don't like assign you to zones. Oh, you live in zone four. Then you go to this house. No, I hate. Oh, I, would, I don't even like going to nobody's house. If I don't know you, I'm not going to bust up in your house. I'm here to have meaningful, deep relationship. No, you ain't. I don't know you. And listen, just get honest. When, when we show up at somebody's house and we don't really know them, we're all fake. Hi, 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 how are you? I'm good, you good, good. What do I sit? You're thinking about what do I sit on? What do I not touch that? Do you, what, what was grandma's? Where is, you know, what, 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 what? And it just makes you so nervous. Yeah. We're that way around our family, let alone people we know. And so you can't force, that's why we don't say, okay, all the single people, I'm going to sing all the single ladies, but I don't even know that song, so I wouldn't have sung that. But all the, <laughs> God save whoever just said, yeah. Um, if we say all the single people go over, you be in this group. That's a recipe for disaster. That's called a dating group. That's christianmingles.com. Now, all the old people go over there. I told the first service, I don't ever want to go to a group with all old people. I have to go to see that beer on some young people to learn how to dress. Because once my dressing gets like old people, I got to, you know, you got to change. I don't, want to be, I don't want to be around a certain type of people. I just want to be with people who are passionate after God that I connect with in meaningful relationship. So don't, don't get worried you think we're going to stick you in some discipleship relationship. Look, probably most of you are sitting by someone that you came to church with or sitting near someone you know. Those are the most likely deep relationships that you can begin to have discipleship with and grow in Christ with. Next is discipleship is intentionally helping someone else grow in Christ. It's intentionally, it's not by accident. It's intentionally seeing the things where you're not believing correctly and saying, brother, I need to, I need to correct you. Uh, sister, I need to tell you. It, it's where you say to one another, honey, I, I need to tell you what you said in that situation. That was not Christ-like. It is intentional. It doesn't just happen by accident. And I believe that here at VC2, the vision God has given us for Central Georgia will be accomplished as we intentionally grow in these discipleship relationships. Because in that, we learn to speak the truth in love and grow up. And you see, like we learned last week, that helps build strong bricks. And to have strong bricks gives us a strong wall. And it, 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 it's strengthening what God has called us to do here. It may not always be easy. Hebrews 12, 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I would like to say that every time Pastor Melinda or, or some of my friends that I'm in discipleship relationship, one of the brothers, one of the trustees, or one of the elders comes to me and says, Pastor, I need to talk to you. Now, I heard you say this, but this is what you teach, so help me understand. I would like to say, I go, yay, thank you for coming. Oh, did you bring cake? This is going to be a party. I would like to say I get happy, but listen, let's get over it. So what if I don't get happy about it? Amen. So what if I get a little tood that I then got to work through the tood 
and get to the truth. So what? If you love me, if you saw me about to drive over a cliff and you knew it was a cliff, would you say, there's pastor going to that cliff, but I don't want to tell him. Does that hurt his feelings? It's going to hurt my feelings a lot more if you let me drive over the cliff. Amen. Hello, somebody? Yeah. Well, brother, you can't speak to anyone like that. We can't do each other. Well, you see, if you love me, if you love me. Now, remember the old adage, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's why in the relationships where we are growing and you know it when you're in that kind of relationship. And you know how I test them out? I just go and say, brother, can I share? Do, are we close enough that I can share something with you? I love this, the fact that true disciples make disciples. True disciples make disciples. And, and if we're going to be true disciples and make disciples, then we're going to have to help each other grow up. We grow up by, by being honest about things. Being honest. When somebody says something to you that is not scriptural, what do you do about it? Now, I'm not asking you to go around correcting the whole world. I'm talking about strong discipleship relationships. How, what do you do? How do you handle when you're in relationship with somebody and they say something that's not scriptural? Are you able to correct them? Are you able to say, but that's not what the Bible says? Are you able to speak to them? Like I hear people talking about healing. I've seen recently a, a, a people... they. they it is amazing to me that we have to fight about new covenant rights. I mean, the word for salvation, sozo, means spirit, soul, and body. He saved us. And Isaiah, who's heard our report, who's believed, he goes on to say, by his stripes we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes we are healed. We know that Egypt... Israel came out of, and we say it's a type and a shadow of salvation. We know they came through the waters like we come through the waters of baptism. We know they came out of Egypt, and the Bible says there was not one sick among them. The Bible says they came out, and they were wealthy. You know how I know they were wealthy? Because they started some tomfoolery and made a, a gold calf. How did slaves, after being in slavery for 400 years, have gold to make a calf? Well, we know it because we see that they... Ask of their captors, give us your gold before they left. So they left slavery for 400 years. Somebody's got to catch this. They left healthy, wealthy, and wise. They left. They, and Pharaoh said, get. And not only that, the night before, there was the death that, that covered the land. And they were safe because of the Passover lamb. And they left the next day healed and whole because they had partaken of the Passover lamb. Yeah. And then I hear people tell me, well, if it be the Lord's will, he'll heal me. Well, what's the Lord's will? Look at his word. Right. That's right. You say, well, brother, are you trying to get all Pentecostal? Healing is not a Pentecostal thing or a charismatic thing or some fluke thing. Healing is Part of my new covenant rights. Now, as I read it and as I understand it, it's just part of my benefits. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Even David got, y'all like, well, that's just a new, a newfangled thing people be saying. Well, David was newfangled then. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He heals all my diseases. Amen. Oh, and so I can claim that as a benefit. Well, brother, let's just pray if it be God's will. But if God wants to teach you something with this cancer. Excuse me, say what? Stupid, say what? If God wants. Now let me be real quick to say God can use anything he wants to teach anybody he wants. And let me be real quick to say God can do anything he wants because he's God and I'm not. But I do not see it in the counsel of the word that he has to get cancer. To... What kind of father would I be to chop off my child's hand to teach him a lesson? Josiah, I've told you enough times. Come here, I'm chopping it off. And I'll teach you. I can't even joke about that. He's my heartbeat. How could I do that to him? Then how can a loving heavenly father? Amen. And besides, if you eat poisons all your life and then get cancer and blame it on God. I'm just saying. 
And so when we find these things, Pastor, you went to meddling. You were going good and you went to meddling. I'm just saying that when we find these things and we start teaching each other the word, you hear somebody talking about where they're at in their life, find what the Bible says. And listen, if you say, I don't believe you that healing is for today, that's beautiful. You go study it out. And then when you're ready, let's get together. We'll come and reason together. But I believe if you study, you're going to see exactly the conclusion I came to, even though I wasn't raised believing that. When I studied the word and saw the truth of the new covenant in Christ that we have. Listen to this, this quote by Scott McKnight from a book, One Life, Jesus Calls, We Follow. This blew me away. This is such deep revelation. Are you ready for this? Those who aren't following Jesus aren't his followers. Those who aren't following Jesus aren't his followers. It's that simple. Followers follow. And those who don't follow aren't followers. To follow Jesus means to follow Jesus into a society where justice rules, where love shapes everything. To follow Jesus means to take up his dream and work for it. Can somebody say amen? amen. Let me just tell you something. If you aren't living like Christ, please don't call yourself a Christian. I'm, I'm about to say something that's going to be a little challenging, a little hard. But if you aren't living like Christ, don't call yourself a Christian. Call yourself a studier of religious things. Call yourself a believer of Jesus' teachings. Call yourself a churchgoer, a music lover. Call yourself whatever you want to call you. But if you're not going to follow Christ, don't call yourself a Christian. There's enough of that going on. And if you say you're following Christ, follow him and act like him. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul said to Timothy, these things that you've heard me teach, entrust those to faithful men who will be able to teach them others. That's discipleship. That's saying, look, bro, you're not, you're not getting it because you're, you've got this going on, that, but I want to help you. Let's do this together. Let's work together. Teach these things. When we are involved in discipleship, it helps us get the focus off us and on to others. You know, we're, we're encouraged to do nothing out of selfish ambition. We're encouraged to look not only to our needs, but others. That's discipleship. And the last thing is, in the beginning, we're commanded to be fruitful and multiply. That was the command that God gave humanity. Be fruitful and multiply. And we know that that, that got all messed up. But I believe in Jesus coming back, rescuing us by his death, burial, and resurrection, and then saying to us, all authority is given to me, now you go and make disciples. It is the same command we had in the beginning. Be fruitful and multiply. Make disciples. You understand as we looked, the, the gospel is not just that we go and tell everybody the good news, but uh, the great commission is that we make disciples. It's more than just going and preaching. Though you've probably been told that's enough, it's not. And getting somebody to say a prayer, that's not enough. Because folks, we have millions of people who've prayed prayers, but they've never learned how to follow Christ. And we're supposed to help each other learn to follow Christ. Amen? Amen. For you to refuse to be in a discipleship relationship is for you to declare that you have no need of anyone. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, we need each other. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We need each other because together we are stronger. Would you bow your head? Lord, I know that there are people in here from all walks of life. There are people in here from every or many different places in our spiritual walk with you. Maybe there's some in here today who've never even surrendered and started following you. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to do what only you can do. I'm asking you to speak to our hearts today. What is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart today? What is he asking you to do? What do you feel he's requiring of you? If you're in this place today and you say, I've never chosen to follow Christ, Man, today would be a great day to do that. You say, what, what must I do to be saved? You must believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. You must believe in your heart. 
that Jesus is who he said he was, that he came and he did what he said he would do, that he died on the cross, went into the ground, and he rose again just like he said he would do. You must confess with your mouth because everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's with the heart that you believe and with the mouth that you confess. You say, well, I, I got to say that sinner's prayer, don't I? Yeah, that is a sinner's prayer. Jesus saved me. What's he requiring of me? Oh, not much. Just everything. I gotta, I gotta quit stuff. No, you just gotta die. Gotta die. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta give up your life. Surrender to him. Follow Christ. If, you, if you've been saying you, you've been following Christ, but you hadn't been learning to live, love, or leave behind what Jesus leaves behind, and today you say, man, I want that. I want to learn to live like Jesus lived. He came to show us how to love. I want to learn to leave behind what Jesus left behind. Today, what is Holy Spirit saying to you? If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus and you want to do that today, or you're saying, man, I did it, but I've been so far away, I just want to rededicate. I want to, I want to start over. I just want a fresh start. If that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to see your hands in the air, please. Let me see your hand. If that's you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you for all the hands. Thank you, thank you. Church, will you all just stand, please? If you're able, physically able, will you stand? And would you pray this with me for those around you who are praying? Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to die in my stead. Thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life. Thank you, Jesus, for redeeming me. I give you my heart. I give you my life. I choose to follow you. To serve you with all that I am. Holy Spirit, wash over me. Cleanse me. Fill me. I ask in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I thank you there is a fountain that is filled with blood that still cleanses, delivers, heals, and saves. Thank you, Lord. We're asking God today that you restore broken hearts. You heal hurting hearts. You restore broken relationships. You do what only you can do. God, I'm asking that for those of us who are saying today, we want to be in a, a meaningful discipleship relationship that you would lead us to the right person, show us the people, and help us as a church to grow in our love for you, Lord. Help us to grow in our understanding of you and help us learn to leave behind what you left behind in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to find out more about VC2, you can go to vc2online.com. We'd love to hear from you, so check out our Facebook page or find us on Twitter.